The War of the Rebellion is often considered one of the first modern wars. It is important to note that many of the accomplishments that made the War of the Rebellion modern predate the War of the Rebellion, and technically the Crimean War deserves the title far more. However, the War of the Rebellion was special in that troops were much quicker and more frequently shuffled around the country to deal with emerging crises. The vast railroad network of the United States permitted the movement of troops and helped in alter the face of war. This will be a five episode series looking at troop movement. This episode focuses on the movement of the 11th and 12th Corps from Virginia to Chattanooga. disaster that befell Rosecrans's Army of the Cumberland at Chickamauga prompted major changes in the Western command structure, elevating Ulysses S. Grant to command of all armies from the Appalachian Mountains to the Mississippi River. Even more, with the Army of the Cumberland besieged in Chattanooga, relief was needed. Units from the Army of the Potomac and the Army of the Tennessee were ordered to help. The U.S. government could rely on the able work of Daniel McCollum, the head of the U.S. Military Railroad. McCollum had previously run the Erie Railroad, but he was overseeing a much larger operation for the U.S. military. It was his task to deal with the logistical nightmare of moving two corps. On September 24, the leading figures to make the move happen met at the War Department. John Garrett, Tom Scott, Prescott Smith and McCollum worked out the details of the move that should take each soldier less than seven days on the trains. The first part of the journey would be on board the U.S. Military Railroad, run by McCollum himself, moving the soldiers from the Army of the Potomac to Washington. In Washington, the soldiers would board trains from the Baltimore to Ohio, taking them to the Ohio River. Garrett and Smith would oversee this part of the journey. At Benwood in West Virginia, the troops crossed the river on a newly constructed pontoon bridge. In combination of four other railroad companies would carry them to Louisville in Kentucky, where a bridge made from coal barges would facilitate the second river crossing of the Ohio. The final stretch to Chattanooga was on the Louisville-Nashville Railroad to Nashville and then the Nashville and Chattanooga Railroad to Bridgeport in Alabama. The total distance traveled came in at about 1,200 miles and would involve five sets of 30 trains, each train with 20 cars. None of the railroad companies involved had that capacity available. There were alternative roads discussed to use other lines and even river and canal transportation. It was also not the shortest or easiest route but some of the organizers had financial stakes in the railroads involved and stood to benefit from this massive troop movement. On September 24, around 10.30 a.m., General Meade notified Oliver O. Howard by telegram that his 11th Corps should break down their bivouacs, prepare five days of cooked rations, 
and get ready to board the trains. Meade also telegraphed Henry Slocum to get ready for the same journey once the First Corps had replaced the man of the Twelves doing picket duties along the Rappahannock. Halleck decided to put Joseph Hooker in charge of the movement. As men were the most important item, Halleck opted to send the soldiers as quickly as possible and have baggage and equipment, as well as artillery, follow at a more leisurely pace, something abandoned when the reality of the move started. Aware of how urgent these troops were needed in Chattanooga, the principal architects of the move made sure to supervise the troop movement in person to make sure things ran smoothly. For the commanders, there was also the hope to keep the movement as quiet as possible to avoid detection by rebel forces. The U.S. military railroad officers determined to speed the process of loading the soldiers up as much as they could by having them board trains at different stations simultaneously. Instead of one long train to fill, they ran a number of short trains. The speed of their operation required a tight look at discipline to avoid absconding soldiers. As the soldiers made their way up the line to Washington, Smith prepared the Baltimore and Ohio for the next step, promising McCollum that he would have 140 passenger cars waiting by noon on September 25 in Washington. Smith was actually able to get 194 cars and 44 boxcars to Washington by that afternoon, with 30 more arriving by the evening. The organizers had to ask other lines in the area for cars to make the move happen. The Pennsylvania, Wilmington, and Baltimore provided 60 passenger and 40 box cars. However, they decided to simply keep the soldiers on the USMRR cars and make a temporary swap, thus eliminating the need to change trains and lose time. While the first troops started boarding their trains in Bristow Station, Garrett was working on arranging the next stage from the Baltimore to Ohio terminus to Jeffersonville, Indiana. He requested 175 passenger and 50 box cars for baggage. It was not going to be a comfortable journey for these soldiers. 42 hours after the government had decided to reinforce Rosecrans from the Army of the Potomac, the first 50 carloads of soldiers were on their way. The planning hit a bump as McCollum's men in Virginia dispatched trains as quickly as they could load some, causing a massive train jam on the Orange and Alexandria Railroad. At the same time, by the afternoon of September 26, the first cars reached Cumberland, Maryland. By Sunday morning, September 27, 12,000 men were on their way, with 30 cars of artillery and 21 of baggage. The entire 11th Corps passed Cumberland by that afternoon, with the 12th close behind. At 1.30 p.m. on September 28, the final train left for Chattanooga. By the moment the last train pulled out Virginia, the first elements of the massive operation reached Indianapolis, where a gauge difference between two rail lines created a bottleneck for the operation. All troops had to get off their trains and onto new trains. Adding to the delay was a local decision to feed all the soldiers a hot meal in town. In Louisville, Tom Scott had arrived on September 26 to manage the final stretch of the journey. Having visited the region on a fact-finding mission a year earlier, Scott was familiar with the region's railroad layout. Most concerning was the final stretch from Nashville to Bridgeport as the rail line was in terrible shape and badly constructed. As the soldiers lumbered down the railroad from Indianapolis, Scott was ready to send them down to Bridgeport as quickly as possible, urging the local commander to make sure a quick unloading and return of the trains occurred. By October 1st, the entire 11th Corps was in Bridgeport and the 12th was passing Nashville. The final part of the move was not completed until October 16, when the final equipment and animals arrived. It was an astonishing feat to transport such a large force over such a long distance 
in such a short amount of time. Moving two corps with over 10,000 soldiers and equipment in just about a week, over 1,200 miles, was an unheard of development. The men eventually constituted the 20th Corps under the command of Joseph Hooker, but their work at Chattanooga helped open the town and win the battle. The man did not return to the Army of the Potomac when the crisis passed. The remain for the Atlanta campaign and the march to the sea. However, the shift of such a large force signaled the importance of railroads to military planners and what possibilities the railroad had opened. This shift of troops is a great example of the changing mobility and face of war. Thank you for watching this episode of the War of the Rebellion channel. If you liked the material covered, Please like and subscribe to the channel. Hit the notification bell for new episodes. If there's a story of the War of the Rebellion you would like covered, please leave a comment. Use the comments to engage in conversations. Thank you for patronizing the War of the Rebellion channel.